Hello, my name is John Coonrod with Rogers Corporation. I am a technical marketing manager, and today I'm going to be talking to you about comparisons of MicroStrip and Granite Coplanar Waveguide. If you give me just a second, let me share my screen and we'll get started. So uh, the agenda I plan on following is uh, shown here, and I'm going to first talk about a quick uh, overview and simple RF uh, comparisons between MicroStrip and Ground Coplanar Waveguide. After that, I'm going to spend a lot more time on the practical aspects that which impact um, RF performance and RF variation of uh, MicroStrip and Ground Coplanar Waveguide. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, here I have visually shown a uh, microstrip transmission line on the left and a grounded coplanar waveguide on the right. It's also called a conductor back coplanar waveguide. I'm just going to call it grounded coplanar waveguide or GCPW. And just as general comments, uh, microstrip transmission lines or microstrip structures are usually used at lower frequency like microwave frequencies. And then as uh, the applications uh, progress into the higher frequency millimeter wave range of frequencies, that's when uh, ground to coplanar waveguide is often considered. And in theory, ground to coplanar waveguide has a lot of potential to reduce some of the issues for millimeter wave frequencies. And just a quick list of some of the concerns uh, for these higher frequencies would be radiation, uh, spurious wave mode um, propagation, also unwanted resonances and also dispersion. And then I've given a little bit of a definition of what I'm talking about from microwave frequencies and millimeter wave frequencies at the bottom there. So as a quick general comparison, and I will admit this is very subjective, but it's uh, probably a good thing to go through just to give you uh, an idea of comparisons between these RF structures. Far left column is the RF structures, microstrip, granite coplanar waveguide, and uh, the dominant wave propagation mode for both of these uh, are the same. It's a quasi-TEM wave. There are other wave propagation modes that can propagate on these structures, such as a hybrid TE wave or a hybrid TM wave. And there can also be surface waves and the microstrip structure is more uh, susceptible or uh, you could actually design with surface waves on microstrip. Granite coplanar waveguide would be a little bit more tricky and um, that's the different wave propagation modes that are potentially uh, on the circuits. Typically though, uh, the designs are such that the quasi-TEM wave is what's desired. As for radiation loss at uh, lower frequencies, microwave frequencies, as a general comment, radiation and radiation loss is less of a concern. As you go to higher frequencies, that becomes much more of a concern and microstrip can have issues uh, pretty significant issues actually at millimeter wave frequencies for radiation and quasi, uh, I'm sorry, and the granite coplanar waveguide, <clears throat> if it's designed correctly, uh, you can have uh, very little issues with radiation loss and maybe even eliminate it completely. The column for ease of uh, mode of suppression, I'm talking about suppressing the unwanted modes, the uh, TE or the hybrid TE and the hybrid TM modes possibly the surface wave modes. Uh, but anyway, trying to suppress those modes uh, at higher frequencies is really difficult for a microstrip. And granite coplanar waveguide, just by the nature of the structure, you have more flexibility in the, in the design to be able to suppress these modes. Dispersion, that's usually an issue at higher frequencies that are very wide band. And at millimeter wave frequencies, microstrip is a dispersive uh, medium. So that's just the nature of the beast. If the granite coplanar waveguide is designed correctly, you can have very little dispersion or maybe no dispersion at uh, these millimeter wave frequencies. And then ease of signal transitions. What I'm talking about there is uh, in the design phase and part of the design you may have to do impedance transformers or some kind of transition of the signal. And uh, those transitions normally have some reflections associated with them unless you're very careful of the design, of course. And uh, the ease of doing that design is pretty difficult for microstrip at millimeter wave frequencies. And at these frequencies, granite coplanar waveguide is a much easier structure to work with. Uh, and then the last column is a, a really pretty big deal and I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about today and that's how much the RF performance can vary due to circuit fabrication. 
And as general comments, once again, uh, microstrip and depending on the design and how sensitive the circuit is and things like that, generally speaking, microstrip is not that much affected, not significantly affected by the normal variations of printed circuit board fabrication. However, a granite coplanar waveguide can be moderately affected to highly affected uh, for RF performance and RF performance variation due to circuit fabrication. And also, I wanted to go through just the basics of these two structures. And this is looking at cross-sectional views, microstrip on top, granite coplanar waveguide on the bottom. And I'm looking at the electric fields as the red lines, magnetic fields are not drawn. The magnetic fields would wrap around the signal conductor and the propagating wave would be coming out of the monitor at you. And um, I'm also showing the uh, current density as uh, blue areas. <clears throat> and these are good things to keep in mind as we go farther into this presentation and talk about how some of the printed circuit board fabrication variations can affect the RF performance of these structures. So for microstrip, you can see uh, the signal conductor on the left and right edge of the signal conductor, there is higher current density. And because of that, it can be sensitive to the plated finish and other things that are applied to the signal conductor. And for the granite coplanar waveguide, you will see the same thing. You have coupling fields between the ground signal ground and also current density along those sidewalls. And that current density, that uh, shape that I've drawn there, the current density is approximately correct. Uh, however, that can change if that signal conductor is trapezoidal, that would actually cause the current density to shift down to be more focused at the base, at the copper substrate interface than as shown. And also if you have final plated finishes, uh, now you have four layers or four areas, let's say, that could be affected with granite coplanar waveguide. And same with solder mask. If solder mask is applied, now you have more fields uh, that would be fringing or coupled through that solder mask. So it's things like that that you want to think about. So let's talk about trapezoidal effects. Uh, on the upper left is a cross-sectional view of an ideal microstrip transmission line circuit showing rectangular um, conductors. And just below that is also the same microstrip circuit that's actually showing the real world uh, view. And in reality, when you look at micro sections for these circuits, what you typically see is not a rectangular shape. And that rectangular shape is actually often assumed in a lot of electromagnetic modeling software. And in reality, if you look at micro sections of circuits, you normally see a trapezoidal shaped conductor as I've shown on the bottom left. And then same with the granite coplanar waveguide that is the uh, right side. So the upper right is the um, ideal rectangular shape and the bottom right would be the trapezoidal shape. And um, as I've already mentioned, most of the circuits uh, in reality are, are uh, trapezoidal shaped and that trapezoidal shape does vary from batch to batch. And as a general comment, the variation of that trapezoidal shape has very little influence on the RF performance for microstrip, but that trapezoidal shape most certainly can affect the coupling fields in the granite coplanar waveguide and does. So the variation of that trapezoidal shape could be of interest for granite coplanar waveguide. Now, uh, in theory, there's uh, two different types, well, there's actually more than that, but I'm really showing uh, a tightly coupled and ground, tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide and a loosely coupled granite coplanar waveguide. Left is tightly coupled, right is loosely coupled, and the main difference is tightly coupled has a very small gap, small space between the uh, coplanar ground signal ground on the top copper layer, loosely coupled has a larger space. And for tightly coupled as compared to loosely coupled, I have a list of bullets there of the benefits for tightly coupled. And this is in theory, because in practice, there are some other things to consider. But in theory, a tightly coupled ground coplanar waveguide will be better at suppressing, uh, suppressing spurious wave modes. It's also going to be better than loosely coupled in eliminating unwanted resonances and minimizing wideband dispersion and also minimizing or eliminating radiation. So in general, tightly coupled ground coplanar waveguide has much more benefits than loosely coupled. Now, if this loosely coupled coplanar waveguide was extremely loosely coupled, then it becomes MSL, which stands for a microstrip like. And at that point, it may have the structure as a ground coplanar waveguide, but it's really behaving as a microstrip. 
So uh, there's some drawbacks to tightly coupled uh, grounded coplanar waveguide, mostly related to circuit fabrication. And what I'm going to show here is uh, a list of a few items to consider. So tightly coupled grounded coplanar waveguide compared to loosely coupled. The tightly coupled is definitely going to be more sensitive to uh, the thickness variation of the copper. So as the copper is made, uh, basically as the circuit is made, they drill holes and they plate copper through the holes. And along with that, they plate copper, uh, the circuit image gets plated up too. So if the laminate started off with a half ounce copper that's about 0.7 mils thick, and then it goes through the process of the plated through hole and plating up the circuit image, the final circuit itself, that copper thickness is probably gonna be 1.7 mils thick or some thickness greater than what the original copper was in the laminate. And that thickness will vary from batch to batch and circuit to circuit. And that thickness variation is going to be more problematic on a tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide than a loosely coupled granite coplanar waveguide. And then the same concern with final plated finishes, and that is the tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide with very strong coupling fields between the ground signal ground is going to be more impacted by um, the uh, variation of the final plate of finish than loosely coupled. And then finally, the trapezoidal effects that I already talked about some, that's going to be more impactful on the RF performance for the tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide than it would the loosely coupled. Now, just to show some quick comparisons here of microstrip and granite coplanar waveguide, this is a comparison of bare copper versus ENIG using the exact same material. The material is eight mils thick RL4003C laminate. On the left is the chart for the microstrip circuit. On the right is a chart showing insertion loss of granite coplanar waveguide that's tightly coupled. And the red curve is the bare copper circuit, which is an ideal circuit. And then the blue curve is the circuit with ENIG, electrous nickel immersion gold. And nickel being about one quarter of the conductivity of copper is going to cause more conductor losses and ultimately more insertion loss. Now in the case of microstrip, the difference of losses at 50 gigahertz is about a difference of 0.5 dB per inch between the bare copper circuit and the ENIG circuit. Now that same comparison for granite coplanar waveguide, <clears throat> excuse me, at 50 gigahertz, that difference is 1.2 dB per inch difference. So the granite coplanar waveguide is much more impacted by the final plate of finish ENIG in this case than is microstrip. And again, that's because of the fields in the coupled area using more of the lossy finish than it is for microstrip. <clears throat> Now, for these different final plate of finishes, they do have a normal uh, process variation. And what normally varies is the nickel thickness. So for ENIG, that nickel thickness can vary, and it can vary a pretty good amount. So what I did was an experiment where I used the exact same materials. It's 5 mil RO3003 with rolled copper. And I had circuits made, and the circuits were microstrip and tightly coupled granite coplanar waveguide. The chart on the left are for microstrip. Chart on the right is the granite coplanar waveguide. And again, what I'm comparing is bare copper circuits to the ENIG. But in this case, I'm comparing the bare copper circuit to ENIG with nickel plated thin and nickel plated thick. So for the microstrip circuit, bare copper circuits blue curve. The ENIG with thin nickel is the orange curve. The ENIG with thick nickel is the gray curve. And you can see there is a significant difference in the RF performance between the nickel being thin and thick. And this is a normal variation to expect for the nickel thickness. Now that same comparison with grounded coplanar waveguide and also realizing that the scale is much larger on the grounded coplanar waveguide chart, the difference between the thin and thick nickel is much greater. So again, the grounded coplanar waveguide is more impacted by these differences of uh, the conductor effects, which in this case is due to the nickel being thin and thick for the electrous nickel emerging gold. So let's talk about copper plating thickness. And copper plating thickness variation does vary from circuit to circuit. Even circuits on the same panel, the copper thickness can vary. And in circuits uh, that are made in large volume from panel to panel and batch to batch, you can see that the, the copper will vary in thickness. So what I did was a study where I used the exact same sheet of material to minimize material effects. I started off with a panel that was 24 by 18 and that material was 10 mil thick RL4835 laminate. And I cut that panel in half and now I have two half panels, <coughs> excuse me, 
two half panels that are 12 by 18. One of these half panels went off to have circuits made with thin copper, and one pa half panel went off to have circuits made with thick copper. The designs were exactly the same, material is exactly the same, everything was the same. The only difference is I had the circuit fabricator purposely plate thin copper on one sub panel and thick cop copper on the other sub panel. And this is the result I got. Now these circuits are tightly coupled ground to coplanar waveguide and loosely coupled. The tightly coupled ground to coplanar waveguide is the red and the blue curves. And uh, the red curve is the uh, circuits that were tightly coupled with thick copper. Blue curve is tightly coupled ground to coplanar waveguide with thin copper. And there is a difference of 0.1 in effective dielectric constant, which is the y-axis. And the difference of 0.1 in effective dielectric constant is pretty significant, especially when you realize this is the exact same sheet of material. And the only difference really is the thickness of the copper. So thicker copper means you have more electric fields fringing in error or coupled in error. And error is the lowest dielectric constant, so it is going to have a lower effective dielectric constant. Now what's interesting is the uh, loosely coupled ground to coplanar waveguide also shows a difference, but it shows less of a difference. And that is the purple curve and the green curve. <clears throat> now the difference in effective dielectric constant is 0 0.075. And that is much less than the tightly coupled. So the difference of thick and thin copper is less impactful on the loosely coupled circuits than it is on the tightly coupled circuits. So this is a pretty quick overview of microstrip comparing to granite coplanar waveguide and also giving you some of the hints to be mindful of when you're designing with granite coplanar waveguide. And I'd like to leave you with a screenshot of our Rogers Technology Support Hub. This is a, a website that we're very proud of and I invite you to become a member. And as a member, you can have access to calculators, free software, some of the software for download. You also have the Raj mobile apps, you have technical papers, video library, and you can also contact an engineer in your region. And that's all I have now for this topic, and I thank you for your attention.